Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest show you will see anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us here on Facebook and YouTube as we help to raise your health IQ. And Dr. Neil Barnard is here with us today as we open up the doctor's mailbag to answer questions about the thyroid. How much help can you get for a thyroid from the food that you're eating? So we're going to learn whether overindulging in things like burgers and fries and those double cheese pizzas that you see all over the TV, well, can that lead to a sluggish thyroid? We're going to find out. But then on the flip side, what kind of help can you get from a healthier diet, one that's lower in fat and has way more fruits and vegetables and way less burgers and fries? We're going to find that out as well. We're going to open up the doctor's mailbag, which means that we're going to be answering your questions about your thyroid. So if there's something that you would like to ask Dr. Barnard, go ahead and drop that in the comments or the chat box right now. You can even send it to me on Twitter or Instagram. I'm at Chuck Carroll WLC. Just make sure when you send in that question, you use the hashtag exam room live. So let's not waste any time. Let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Barnard to the show today and start answering some questions. Sir, thank you very much for being here. Hi, Chuck. Great to be with you. I'm glad that you're here for the thyroid topic because I know that this is something that you got an opportunity to write about extensively in your latest book, Your Body Imbalance. So uh, you've got a lot of research that I know that you're familiar with, and I think that we can give a lot of people some help today. Well, it's such an important topic because it's one that people really don't understand too much. Um, if you ask a person to point to their thyroid, they might not even know where it is, or and if they do know, they're not too sure what it does, but, but they often feel the effects. Uh, people will get out of bed one day and they'll say, I don't really feel my, like myself. They're kind of sluggish. And then they walk into the bathroom, they stand on the scale, and they're three pounds up from the last time they checked. And then they look in the mirror and they'll think, gee, my skin doesn't look healthy and my, my hair doesn't look healthy and their digestive tract is not working very well. So if you go to the doctor and you say all of these things, you know, low energy, weight gain, and, and skin changes, hair changes, we, we're going to think, you know, no doctor could diagnose this because it's just too vague. But the doctor says, wait a minute, this to me sounds like the constellation of symptoms that suggest your thyroid isn't working very well. And so your thyroid is here at the base of your neck. It makes thyroid hormone and it goes to the cells of your body to give them energy. And if it's not working right, you've got too little energy and a lot of other things go wrong. The flip side can happen. You can have too much thyroid hormone and that creates all the flip side of symptoms. You're revved up um, and not feeling well in other ways. So either way, you want to get your body back in balance. How common are thyroid issues among people? Because we talk a lot about cancer and heart disease and other kinds of chronic illnesses on this show, but how, how big of a problem is thyroid for so many people? It's, it's quite common. Um, hypothyroidism is quite common, um, but often underdiagnosed. And also it's not even. Um, you'll see more of it in certain parts of the world um, than others. And also over time, it has not been a constant thing. Um, we saw quite a lot of it. In fact, here in the United States up until 1924. Um, and that was the year that the Morton company started selling iodized salt. Um, the iodine, um, is a way to fight hypothyroidism. All right. Well, let's go ahead and open up that doctor's mailbag right now. Dr. Barner, the first question comes to us from Naya, who actually just read your book. She said, after reading your book, I'm convinced that my many trips through the drive through are why I'm taking Synthroid. If I stop going and start eating healthier at home, is it possible that I could get off medication? Uh, it's possible. Um, but you may not have to stop going to the drive through It might be at what you order on that speaker when you're going through. For example, if you were going through the drive-thru and getting the, the, the uh, uh, taco covered with extra cheese and meat, mm -hmm. what if we were to switch that to a bean burrito, hold the cheese or something like that? What I'm getting at is um, there's nothing about the rapidity with which your meal is made. In other words, fast food in and of itself isn't the issue. It's a question of what those foods actually are. Uh, we need more research in this area, but um, the, the big... I'm going to call it kind of earth shattering research study that came out was with the Adventist health study too. Um, as we've talked about on this program before, um, Adventists have been under the microscope for 
forever, it seems like. And, and the reason is they're an ideal research population. They're the Seventh-day Adventists are mostly non-smokers, teetotalers, very, very health conscious people. And many of them are vegan or vegetarian and many are not. So researchers have loved this natural experiment where you can compare, say, a meaty diet and a vegan diet in people who are otherwise pretty health conscious and clean livers. And, I mean, they're living clean. I didn't mean to say their livers are clean, although that's probably true too. Um, and what they found is kind of what you might expect, but we can't exactly explain that when it comes to low thyroid, the people who do the worst are actually the dairy consuming vegetarians. In other words, the people who aren't eating meat, but they're making up for it with extra cheese and milk um, have the highest prevalence of hypothyroidism. And who's got the lowest prevalence of low thyroid? Vegans. Um, and the people who eat meat, but not so much dairy are kind of in between the two. And then when it comes to hyperthyroidism, high thyroid, the people who do the worst there are the folks eating dairy and meat. Um, and what we think is going on is that these foods trigger an immune reaction in your body. It's like the food is a foreign invader and your body recognizes the dairy proteins, the meat proteins, makes antibodies to them. Those antibodies then accidentally attack your thyroid and harm it, harm its ability to function. And so that's what we think is happening. So vegans do the best in whether it's hypo or hyper. And if you are um, on Synthroid now and you want to get off it, I would definitely go to a completely plant-based diet as healthy as you can be. Talk to your endocrinologist and see if you can get off your Synthroid. Good follow-up question here from Pete. Wants to know whether a whole food plant-based diet helps more with hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. Have there been any studies comparing the two head-to-head? We haven't really got very good studies in this uh, in this area at all, to, to, in my own view. Um, what we have are these big observational studies. And we also have a lot of individuals who have made changes in their own lives. Of, of those, of the case reports we've seen, um, we've seen a lot of people where they had hypothyroidism, um, where it's gone away with a diet change. And in fact, I've described a few of these cases in, in your body and balance. But we do also see some cases with hyperthyroidism as well. Um, there was a, a very noteworthy case of a, a person who's been a friend to the physician's committee named Wendy, who had a uh, clear diagnosis of hyperthyroidism, and she got over her condition with the diet change too. So it can really, it can be both conditions, but I do think we need more research. Yeah, we had uh, Wendy on the program um, uh, sometime last year. I think it was early last year. Uh, she was on the show along with you and uh, Gene Schumacher was on the show. And then also Dr. Mike Cowan was on the show talking about his issues with the thyroid. And what really struck me about Dr. Cowan's interview was that here it is. A, a, a This guy is a, a neurosurgeon. And he still had no idea that his condition was being driven largely by what it was that he was eating. And the improvements that he saw after changing his diet blew him away. And it blows me away because this is a neurosurgeon, Dr. Barnard. One of the people you could say is arguably one of the smartest individuals walking the face of the earth, just given his profession. And here he is just learning about this connection. Really extraordinary stuff. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, physicians in general um, know about health and they know about the thyroid and they know how it works. And he, uh, Mike Cowan is an extraordinary physician and a, a neurosurgeon, as you said, but beyond that, um, when all of this happened and he's been very good about describing what he went through and being a great advocate for people to think about nutrition. Um, he was, if I recall correctly, he was about 45 and a very health conscious guy. I mean, he's exercising and, and so forth, but, um, he would have an annual physical. And his doctor said, it looks like your thyroid is kind of flagging a little bit. And the way the doctor knows that is with a blood test. They look for something called TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone. This is a hormone that your body makes to push your thyroid into action. And if your thyroid is working pretty well, you don't need very much TSH because it's already doing its thing. But if your TSH level is higher and higher and higher, that means looks like your thyroid must be pretty sluggish if your body has to make all that TSH to make it work. So um, Mike's doctor said your TSH is inching up. It looks like your thyroid's not performing. Well, it could be a fluke. Next year, same story. Next year, a little worse. 
And eventually he got clearly into the, the range of a diseased thyroid. Um, and so at that point, what would happen? Typical medical practice would say, uh, as the earlier caller was on, let's start Synthroid. Well, as fate would have it, he decided to make a diet change for other reasons. He was reading about healthy diets and he and his whole family decided to do a completely plant-based diet. And a few things happen <laughs> when his, his energy gets better. He lose, he wasn't heavy, but he's, he lost you know, a few pounds, maybe seven or eight pounds, something like that. And he went back to his doctor and it's his, his uh, TSH level, instead of being over five, which is clearly in the hypothyroidism range, it dropped down to about 2.9 or something, dr dramatic improvement. And his symptoms were gone. His labs were all totally normalized. And so um, just what you said, Chuck, is, is right. Here you have a person who, who understands medicine and understands the body and specifically understands the thyroid. But he, like the rest of us, had not been aware of what a diet change can actually accomplish. And so I'm hoping that doctors in the future will take this seriously, that we'll do the research studies that we need to really put it together a little bit uh, more, more wisely than we can today. But for now, um, the best prescription clearly is a healthy plant-based diet, very much like the kind of diet you'd use, say, for a person with diabetes. Well, let's talk about some specific foods here. We have a question from Mickey wondering, what are the best vegetables to improve thyroid health? Do we know really what people should be honing in on? Um, the, the, really, your menu is huge. Um, and I think that's the thing to, the thing to, uh, to emphasize. And, and the reason I emphasize it is you'll hear people say, cut various vegetables off your list. And they'll start with the cruciferous vegetables. Um, that's the group of vegetables that gets its name from the cross-shaped flowers on the plants. That's what a cruciferous thing is. But it means broccoli or cauliflower or Brussels sprouts or kale. And so people who are at risk for thyroid disease will often avoid all of these foods. Um, however, if you just take your broccoli and cook it normally, there's really no limit to how much of these things that you can eat. So I would encourage people who are concerned about their thyroid to really eat the same vegetables everybody else does and eat for variety. So have some green vegetables, whether it's broccoli or the non-cruciferous ones like spinach or asparagus or others, they're fine. The, all the lettuces, and knock yourself out. And then have some orange ones, the carrots, the sweet potatoes, have the full variety. And, and same thing for fruits. Um, if you're thinking about which fruits fr should I eat, the answer is yes. <laughs> have, have, have them all, you know. And, and, and frankly, you know, in this country, we would much rather have a Snickers bar than we would have an apple. But nature snack foods, that's the apples and the bananas and the oranges. And be a little exotic if you haven't had a kiwi or if you haven't had a papaya since about, about six years since your trip to Barbados. Um, if you haven't had a mango in a while, try these foods out and, and see what they are. They're like candy. Stock, them, uh, stock up on them. And, and they are far better than the junk food that they replace. All right. Now you're talking about sweets. That brings us to a question from Robbie. Wants to know, does sugar harm the thyroid? I'm on Synthroid, but he says, Slurpees are my life. <laughs> Get a life, really. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? I, if slurpees are your life, we really need more amusement in our in our day to day routine. Okay, I'm pulling your leg a little bit, but um, you're saying you love slurpees. Um, okay, little bad news, little good news. The good news is I don't really think the sugar is affecting your thyroid. I don't think it's a big thing. That said, the bad news is that sugar is not really health food. Um, it's not the number one worst thing in the world. I would say dairy and meat are probably in that category and right behind them after you get away from animal products. Number two bad thing list might be uh, excess oils, particularly coconut oil and palm oil. I would knock those out completely. But eventually you're going to get down to sugar and sugar is not particularly healthy. So I would, I would get away from them. How, however, I got a big caveat on that. Some people will say, okay, I'm with you. I won't have my uh, soda anymore. I'll get the artificially sweetened soda. I wouldn't do that. Um, we used to think that the, the artificial sweeteners were totally innocuous. I don't really think they are. We don't understand exactly why they do what they do, but there have been some studies showing that the artificial sweeteners are linked to, to thyroid conditions too. So frankly, I think they might even be worse than the ones that are flavored with regular, regular sugar. 
There's some controversy, shocker, around soy and thyroid health. So let's take a question from Colleen at 1214. Can soy trigger or worsen hypothyroidism? And conversely, can iodine help? Um, okay, these are great questions, and they're both really important. Um, let's start with the iodine one. And the reason we want to start there is your, your body cannot make any thyroid hormone at all, zero, none, if it doesn't have iodine. Iodine is part of the hormone. And if it's not in your diet, you're not going to make it. You're going to be hypothyroid. But like so many things, if you have too much iodine, you overdid it. You read that I need uh, I need some uh, iodine in my diet. So you go to the store and you get huge amounts. That can be toxic too. You need to be in balance. Um, where do you get it? Iodized salt. We mentioned this at the beginning, 1924. That's when the Morton Salt Company started marketing those little canisters and those blue things with a girl in the umbrella, um, that's got a little bit of iodine in the salt. And that's a good source as long as we're not going crazy with the salt part of it. Um, my favorite source is seaweed, sea vegetables. So if you go to the sushi restaurant, don't have the fish sushi unless you're very well insured. But um, the vegetable rolls, the sweet potato roll, or the asparagus roll, or the cucumber roll, the nori wrapper, that's seaweed and very high in healthy iodine and your wakame um, strips that are in your miso soup. They're rich in iodine too. Uh, be careful about kelp. Kelp is really, really high in iodine. So if you're, if you're getting kelp supplements at the store and they're measured out and you know how much you're getting, that's fine. But if you're having, say, a huge kelp salad every day, you're probably getting more iodine than you, than you want. Um, I'd also suggest avoiding kajiki. You know what I'm talking about? It's a little really dark um, seaweed. Um, it's probably highly contaminated with metals, but but the wakame and the nori are just super great. Okay. Um, so that's iodine. You do need iodine. Uh, let's talk about soy for just a minute. Um, overall, soy is fine. Uh, don't have soy or anything else when you're taking your pill, your, your Synthroid pill, your thyroid medication, because any food, no matter what it is, is going to interfere with its absorption. But soy itself gets mostly a not guilty verdict. There have been some hints about people who are teetering on the verge of hypothyroidism and they are low in iodine also. The question is whether soy could drive them into hypothyroidism. I think that's a really good question, but it really is just, to me, it just means make sure you're getting um, iodine, that you have iodine adequacy. That's really job one. And I think soy is going to turn up to, to be perfectly fine. All right. And as a reminder to Jacketta and everybody else hanging out in the chat room with us here today, if you have a question for Dr. Barnard, go ahead and post that right there in the chat room or in the comments. Send it to me on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag exam room live. Let's take a question from Tain at 1215. Is there hope to get off of thyroid medication through diet even after having a thyroidectomy? Uh, at that point, no. Um, if, if you still have a functional thyroid gland um, and you're hypothyroid because you've got Hashimoto's thyroiditis, for example, which is the most common, um, their uh, person can make a diet change. And in some cases, these people have been able to come off their medication. But it's, I'm sorry to hear what it sounds like what happened to you is that you might have had a tumor or something in the thyroid, for whatever reason, your doctor removed the thyroid. At that point, you're gonna to need to take some, some thyroid hormone for the rest of your life. Now, that's not a bad thing. It's just that you're, the natural factory for it is gone, so you're gonna to need to import it. Um, you can do it, and, um, and it's essential for health. Okay, here's one from Natalia. How many people start their day with a cup of coffee? I would say quite a bit, but Natalia is wondering whether coffee and caffeine should be avoided for thyroid health. No, I don't think they need to be. Um, I would be concerned more about what's going into your coffee. Um, if you're going to Starbucks and getting a latte and it's maybe half coffee and half milk, um, remember what I was saying earlier, that the people at the highest risk of thyroid problems are the people who consume a lot of dairy. So I, I, th I think coffee is not really an issue, um, but the um, but, but I think that the, the things that go into it can be. Now, now that said, um, a lot of people take their thyroid pills in the morning, and that's also exactly when they're having their cup of joe. Don't do that. You can't, you got to have an empty stomach before and after you took your thyroid medicine. So make sure you take it on an empty stomach, no coffee at, the, at that time. 
A lot of people who eat the healthy plant-based diet try to avoid oil completely. So this is a good question from Fabi. You just mentioned nori sheets for iodine. Wants to know what about nori sheets? They actually have some oil on them. Yeah, although it, it didn't come to them naturally. Um, it's, it's added at the factory. Um, the, when it's in nature, it doesn't have it. So you look at different brands and, and you'll get to know them. Um, they'll sometimes have a little bit of sesame oil or other kinds of oil. Um, sometimes added just as a, as a flavoring. And I think it's good to, to, to minimize it. The amount is, is fairly trivial on most of them, and some of they don't have it at all. So have a look and you'll see. All right. Question from Charlotte. A friend told me that turmeric can help with the thyroid. Is that true? It, uh, let me give this a, a qualified maybe. Um, turmeric has been investigated for all kinds of things. And the, the, the main theme is that it's an anti-inflammatory. So in other words, your body reacts to a mosquito bite or a bee sting, and it reacts by inflammation. What that means is your white blood cells say, I've been invaded by the bee, the bee sting or something. Um, and so your white blood cells make antibodies to knock out whatever the bee injected in you or the bit of a stinger or something like that. Or you brushed against some poison ivy, and so your white blood cells make antibodies to try to get away from these antigens, the proteins that are there. And the problem then is that the um, antibodies end up attacking our thyroid gland. And if they attack the thyroid gland's ability to make thyroid hormone, you get your, your hypothyroid. If they attack the control mechanism for the thyroid, so your thyroid can't turn off, you get hyperthyroidism. So what about turmeric? Turmeric is an anti-inflammatory and it turns down that fire. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of people are now saying turmeric might help the thyroid and, and what it might do, they think is sort of slow down or the progression of early hypothyroidism or maybe prevent it altogether. And, and there may be evidence to it. I think it's totally safe. The one caution I have is something that I'm going to call publication bias. And this is when you start to discover that people cheerlead for a certain thing, like grapes have resveratrol. So maybe a glass of red wine is good for us. Let's do a study. And you, you suddenly discover that all the literature is on the side of whatever product people want to push. And sometimes that's because it's true, but other times it's because they didn't want to publish anything that was negative um, or was sponsored by a company. So with the turmeric, turmeric um, supplement manufacturers are the ones doing the trials. I think the, I think the research really looks a little too favorable. So Forgive me for that long-winded answer. The bottom line is turmeric um, is an anti-inflammatory. It is. Um, it's totally safe. And there is some evidence that it's beneficial. But I'm keeping one, well, I'm keeping both eyes open to tell you the truth, to see if larger and more consistent studies continue to bear that out. You want to get them talking today? Post up in the chat room whether you say turmeric or turmeric. This is always a hot debate among the exam roomies. I remember when Dr. Jim Loomis was on the show last year, and I mean, it just turned into a whole kind of kerfuffle, Dr. Barnard. But it sounds like you're a turmeric guy. Well, yes, um, it's the one and only choice. Okay, fair, fair <laughs> enough. All right, uh, let's see. Follow up question about iodine. We have a couple of people wondering about dulse flakes and how much they should be eating uh, every week. Ivan wants to know are just a couple of sprinkles of dulse flakes a couple of times a week enough to get the adequate amount of iodine? Uh, you're, well, first of all, it's way better than all of your friends because they're not doing any. Um, but I would have it be slightly more than that. Yeah, I, I would think so. Um, it, it, I mean, it depends on how you define a sprinkle, but a tiny little whiff of it is not going to do a whole lot. I mean, you could have a, like a whole sheet of nori and it's not going to make, it's not going to, you, you are not going to be over iodinized. All right. Question from Jill. My husband has issues with his thyroid, but isn't willing to stop eating meat yet. Are some meats worse for thyroids than others? For example, is red meat, red meat worse than chicken or pork? I think they're all a problem. I, I really, I really do. Um, Fish sometimes get a little bit of a, um, uh, a pass because it has uh, some iodine in it more than the others do. Um, but on the other hand, that's not really the issue when we talk about the typical kinds of hypothyroidism that we're seeing today, which are antibody driven. And there, I think the fish is as bad as the, the red meat. So I would get away from all of them. Um, the good news is, well, it's kind of mixed news. Most of the people who have either Hashimoto's thyroiditis, that's the low thyroid that's everywhere, or Graves' disease, that's the 
hypothyroidism is pretty common too. Um, the, the people who have them, it's diet related. Um, in some cases, at least, we believe diet's a contributor to it through the antibody mechanism that I described earlier. And those people could still be treated. Um, their treatment, we believe, is going to be easier and maybe even not even necessary if people change their diets. Let's talk about some other nutrients here. We've talked a lot about iodine. Katie at 1230 is wondering how anemia and iron deficiency can affect the thyroid. Yeah, um, there are problems in and of themselves. Um, when, when you're borderline with your thyroid, anything that disturbs your system may cause you to go into a more florid state of it. But with, with regard to anemia, I would make sure that you're just dealing with the anemia in, in and of itself and for its own sake, uh, because all kinds of issues are going to stem from it. Um, that said, um, I'm presuming that when you're saying you have anemia, you're being evaluated by a doctor and treated by a doctor, and I hope so, because some people will say I'm anemic because I'm low in energy or feeling a little pale or something like that. Um, don't self-diagnose. Um, it's important to really have the blood tests and, and check it out. We saw it at 1230. Selenium, how important is that for the thyroid? Yeah, it's important. It's, it's part of it. Um, selenium is um, an element and it's there are modest quantities of it in, in foods. But selenium, like all the elements, comes from the soil, and the amount in different areas is wildly different depending on uh, it, uh, plants grown on, on soil in, say, South America are going to have a different selenium content compared to uh, plants grown on the soil in, in Omaha. So selenium is important. I don't encourage people to necessarily supplement, but I think is is because you can, you can go too far with it. Um, and you've probably heard that there are plenty of foods that are really high, like Brazil nuts. They sure are. But if we're eating a variety of plant-based foods, the selenium is going to pretty well balance out between these sources, and you should be fine. Oh, how about this for a comment from uh, Sweetie Peas at 1232, Dr. Barnard? This is about as good of a compliment as it gets. Just wanted to say thank you for this amazing podcast. It has inspired me to go back to school. I'm on the path to becoming a dietitian. How great is that? That's fantastic. That's great. Um, you know, there are so many people who have a dietitian or have a doctor who hasn't really studied this side of things very well. And so um, congratulations to you for, for going that route and for, for wanting to learn more about really good, healthy overall nutrition. Let me double down on that. I think that that's fantastic. So thank you so very much for saying that. And I'm glad that the show has inspired you to go in that direction. Um, couple more here as we kind of wind down. Uh, Trish also wondering about other nutrients. She was asking about iodine and selenium, which we've talked about, but she's also wondering about calcium and vitamin D. Do they play a role in thyroid health? Re really pretty much a separate thing in my view. Um, calcium is something, as you know, you need for healthy uh, bones. You don't need an enormous amount, but you do need some. Um, 600, 700 milligrams a day. I see as being sufficient, which is to say, even though government guidelines are higher than that, it's hard to really see any increased bone protection from going higher than that. And then the vitamin D is in parallel with the, with the calcium. Vitamin D helps you to absorb the calcium from the foods that you eat. If you don't have vitamin D, the calcium stays in your digestive tract and it doesn't get through. Um, so vitamin D comes from the sun. And if you are never outside in the sun, or if when you are, you're always using sunscreen, then the UV light can't go into your skin and it can't make the vitamin D that it needs. So in that case, you will probably need a supplement and about 2000 IUs a day ought to do it. A lot of people are feeling stressed. So let's take another question from Wiesan here at 1231. Stress and thyroid health, what is the correlation? Is there one? Uh, yeah, there's a huge one. And I think I don't think it is so much that stress causes thyroid problems. Although stress can cause us to eat in particularly bad ways and to not, when we're stressed, let's face it, we'll eat anything just to get through the day. So our diets tend to fall apart and that can make the thyroid act up. But the other side of it can occur as well. If you are low in thyroid, or especially if you are high in thyroid, hyperthyroidism, you will experience it as stress. Um, you'll feel, if you're hyperthyroid, you'll feel um, uncomfortable revved up, something is not right, and you're not sleeping properly. And when you're hypothyroidism, that's no bed of roses either. You, you're you're going to feel uncomfortable too. 
So that, that when, the, when your thyroid is not in balance, stress is one of the ways that you'll kind of experience that. Demi at 1236 is wondering about gluten and whether or not they should stop eating that in order to manage hyperthyroidism. Um, you can. You don't have to have gluten um, in, in your diet. And many people try a gluten-free diet to see if it helps them. For 90% of them, it doesn't really make any difference. Um, about 1% of the population really does need to avoid gluten. These are people who have a clear-cut reaction to it where it tears up their digestive tract. Um, and you just, you've got celiac disease and you, you have to avoid gluten and it's in wheat and it's in barley and it's in rye and a gluten-free diet is a bit of a pain in the neck, but you can do it. Um, and with, if, if you don't have celiac disease and you're just trying a gluten-free diet to see if it helps you, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with trying it. And I would say maybe one in 10 people feels better on a gluten-free diet uh, by feeling better. I mean, mentally better or better digestion. And the other 90% of people don't feel any change except they're annoyed to have to buy gluten-free foods because a gluten-free diet is, a gluten-free diet makes a vegan diet seem really easy, let me put it that way. Let's see if we can knock out uh, about three of these in rapid succession here to take things home. Uh, let's start with one from Andreas at 1238. Can diet sodas and energy, uh, can diet sodas and energy drinks cause subclinical hypothyroidism? I, I think yes. Um, the, the evidence is not conclusive at all, but we've been looking at aspartame and the other um, uh, artificial sweeteners, and there is some evidence that yes, they can impair the thyroid. So steer clear. Question from Roller Girl, 1238. We just talked about stress, but Roller Girl is wondering about depression and thyroid health. Is there a connection there? For sure. Absolutely. Um, depression is a classic sign of hypothyroidism. And when people get back on track, very often they feel better. What that also means is if you are feeling depressed and you're wondering what's this about, um, one of the evaluations your doctor should do first is a TSH. Um, and, and there are other thyroid tests that will follow. But if you are hypothyroidism, your TSH, if you're hypothyroid, your TSH will be high, classic uh, contributor to depression. Final question comes to us from Sasha. Good one. Does the bigger benefit come from eating a plant-based diet or just eating less fat? Plant-based diet. And the reason is for thyroidism, what I'm trying to get away from is, is antigens. So th these are typically proteins. It could be meat proteins or dairy proteins, maybe egg proteins. And those are irritating your immune system, making it attack your thyroid. Going low fat is a really good idea too, but that, but the antigens aren't there. All right. And of course you cover this in depth in the book, Your Body in Balance, which is a fantastic read. So if you haven't had the opportunity yet to pick up a copy, go ahead and do that. Uh, we will put a link to order your copy in the show description or in the episode notes. Uh, Dr. Barnard, any final thoughts today about uh, thyroids and diets? It seems like we've really only scratched the surface and we could go so much deeper with all of this. Uh, just a really interesting, interesting topic. Yeah, uh, just a word of thanks to people for, for tuning in and, and paying attention to this. And also, um, one of the things I, I think is so important for the exam room uh, listeners is you're, you're learning a lot and you're, we're talking a lot about nutrition, but all around us are people who need to know this information too. They may have health issues, but they don't really know uh, what to do about them and they don't have the answers that you have now. So if you would share this information with others, share a link. Uh, to the exam room. Um, all of this information is available free and uh, patients need it. Healthy people who don't want to become patients need it. And you know what? Their doctors need it too. So please share it around if you would. And I just dropped uh, links to uh, subscribe and share the show on both Apple Podcast and Spotify. So look for that in the uh, chat box on both Facebook and YouTube. And by the way, uh, when you go to Apple Podcast and you hit subscribe, please also leave a five-star rating because just as Dr. Barnard was talking about sharing this information, one of the best ways you can do it actually is by subscribing and leaving that five-star rating because it helps the show climb a little bit higher in the rankings. And it's not just about getting to number one for bragging purposes. 
It's because the higher we go on the podcast rankings, literally the easier it becomes for people who need this information the most to find it. You'd be amazed at how many more people click on the show when it's ranked number one, number two, number three, compared to if it's down in the 20s. We got to get this information out to as many people as possible. So please click on those links, leave a five-star rating and a nice comment if you would be so kind. Uh, but Dr. Barnard, my friend, that is all the time that we have today. Uh, thank you so very much for being here and just helping out so many people by answering so many questions. It's been a pleasure, Chuck. Thank you. All right. And if we did not get to your question today, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So stay tuned for that. You can also keep sending them in uh, by posting it in the comments or the chat box. And I promise you, we will do our best to get you an answer on a future show. But for today, that, my friend, is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you one more time to the incredible Dr. Neil Barnard for being here and also uh, to the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund because we could not be doing this show without their support. You know, the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund is it's really born out of the passion and the love that Greg had for uh, animal welfare and promoting vegan diets and health. And there's just so much wonderful work that Allison Mahoney and that foundation are doing. So if you get the opportunity, please, I encourage you to head over to Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund. Head over to their website, GregoryRyderFund.org. That's Ryder, R-E-I-T-E-R, Fund.org. Subscribe to their newsletter and catch up on everything that they've been doing. Allison and the team there are just doing some extraordinary work. And I cannot stress that enough. They are just phenomenal, phenomenal people. But for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We will talk to you again very soon. But until then, keep it plant-based. <laughs>